Ridley Scott's film Blade Runner, an adaptation of the novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, is perhaps one of the most famous and imitated films of all time. Released in 1981, it set the standard in both look and feel for hordes of science fiction films and books to follow. The most conspicuous of these imitations was the so-called cyberpunk fiction of author William Gibson, whose novel Neuromancer inspired almost as many imitations of itself in science fiction as did Blade Runner in its medium. Gibson's short story Johnny Mnemonic, for example, was recently translated into a film version that tried to imitate the look of Blade Runner. But cyberpunk fiction is generally concerned with stories of information hunting and paranoia, and along with such popular shows as The X-Files can be said to represent the myths of McLuhan's global electronic information age. Blade Runner, by contrast, though it inspired the style of these literary and cinematic works, rather belongs, in terms of content at least, to the mythology of the 19th century, and, in particular, the Frankenstein myth. Here, the role of Dr. Frankenstein is played by a genetic engineer named Tyrell, himself the head of the Tyrell Corporation. Tyrell designs biomechanic replicants, or genetically engineered clones, which mimic human beings, with a number of significant exceptions. Replicants are designed to have only a four-year lifespan, and yet they are physically superior to human beings. They are incarnations of Darwinian supermen, genetically engineered to withstand the extremes of outer space, since they are illegal on Earth. Their four-year lifespan thus creates a particularly intense mode of existence for them, paradoxically creating an intensified avidity for life. Harrison Ford plays Deckard, a Blade Runner, and the special task of a Blade Runner is to hunt and kill replicants who have illegally come to Earth. They are not allowed on Earth because of their general ruthlessness in disposing of anyone who gets in their way. Deckard tracks them with a similar determination, and as he is always existing along the razor's edge between life and death, he is indeed a Blade Runner. The replicants who have come to Earth, however, are seeking their biomechanical creator Tyrell, they simply desire longer life, and in this point at least, they are intensely human in nature. Their quest is metaphoric of the general human quest for immortality, and Blade Runner is thus a sort of modern version of Gilgamesh, who went in search of the plant that conferred immortality, which he found but ended up losing. In the following scene, the leader of the four replicants who have escaped to Earth confronts Tyrell, his biomechanical maker. The scene evokes not only the confrontation between Frankenstein's monster and his creator, but also the archetypal and universal confrontation between man as a transient being and the mystery of the infinite, which we in the West term God. It is the eternal quest of the human mind for eternity, the timeless wrestle of the great sages and philosophers with the frustrating and ultimately inescapable fact of their mortality. Here, the replicant discovers that he is indeed doomed to die, and, in a final act of desperation and anger, he destroys his maker, as if that will create in him some sense of resolution. Needless to say, however, it does not. In the final sequence of the film, Deckard finds himself indeed scaling the razor-thin edge between being and non-being. In his struggle to preserve his own existence as he is hunted by the replicant which he himself would normally be hunting, he discovers exactly what it means and feels to be stalked by death. This experience transforms his psyche from one of aggression to compassion as he watches the replicant die, and, like Willard in Apocalypse Now, we are quite certain that his career as an assassin is over. Blade Runner is thus a modern restatement of man's timeless quest for the infinite and shows us, as did 2001, that no matter how sophisticated his technology may become, the inescapable fact of his own mortality cannot be changed. Once again, the theme of autonomous machines turning on their makers is sounded for us. When the implications of such technological aims as creating artificial systems, which can mimic living systems, become clear to us, we must realize that the first and most basic condition of organic life is that it desires to live and, if possible, to replicate. If we successfully accomplish this project, we must realize what the consequences of this will mean for us, namely, one more species, in this case an artificial one, contending for its life against all others. Whatever is interpreted as a threat to that species will be eliminated, as the concern of our next film shows.